Hello and welcome back. Now that we have seen how DAG and explain plan works in Spark, today we will understand Spark Shuffle operation and how Spark handles Shuffle data. We will also see how to optimize Shuffles in Spark. Now, before we can begin, if you have not seen my previous videos, I'll recommend you to go back and watch our playlist from the beginning. Let's begin with some theories today. Now, till now in theory, we know that narrow transformations only work on a single partition. They do not involve other partitions while working. But a wide transformation can involve multiple partitions. So, what Spark does is, there is a concept in Spark called pipelining, where it will combine multiple narrow transformations into a single pipeline and will try to execute this whole pipeline on a single partition. And it will try to execute similar pipelines on all the partitions of the data. But if we encounter a shuffle in between, which is a wide transformation, Spark will break down this pipeline here and will again create a new pipeline with other narrow transformations which are there after this shuffle step. Thus, we know that this pipelining are the stages. Now, that we know that this shuffle stage will break down the pipeline into multiple stages. So what Spark will do? In the first stage, it will execute all the narrow transformations possible and in the end, it will write shuffle files. Now, the shuffle files are something which are encoded in tungsten binary format. We need to know that this is tungsten binary format, which is also known as unsafe row format. Now, once these temporary files are written in the next stage, this would be something that Spark will read in the first step and will process the remaining narrow transformations. And this is how Spark breaks down the whole pipeline into two processes. The first process will start reading your data and will write shuffle temporary files. And the second portion would read your shuffle temporary files and would process the remaining steps. Now, an important point to note here is the shuffle files are written to disks and which are sent over to other executors using the network. So this involves here the disk IO operations and the network, which is a costly operation in Spark. This is why it is very important to avoid shuffle where is it possible. But you cannot avoid shuffle always because sometimes we need some wide transformations to happen. Thus, the only way to deal with it is how to optimize shuffle, which we will see today. I am in my JupyterLab environment. Today, we will work with employees data. Now, if you see on my screen, we have a CSV file where we have multiple columns for this particular file. We have a salary column in this file for which we will be calculating the average salary as per the department ID today. This would be our record set for the whole operation. Now, before we can begin, I'll generate my Spark session. For this, I'll run the code on my Spark cluster. The maximum cores that we can have is 16 and each executor can have four cores. This implies we will have four executor with four cores each. The memory is defined as 512 MB. Let me run this cell. Okay, our Spark session is ready. Let's go back into the cluster and check the setting. So I'm in my cluster. Let me refresh the screen. Okay. Here is the application that is running. If you see, it has 16 cores. Let me expand this. You can see we have four executors with four cores each and each of the executor has 512 MB memory. So this is our Spark UI for the operation. Now, before we start, let's check the default parallelism. Now, we know that we have four executors and four cores each. So total, we can execute 16 tasks in parallel and that should be our default parallelism. Let me run this. Okay, it is 16. Now, for today's session, I'll disable the adaptive query engine. We will discuss about AQE and the adaptive query engine later in our course. So don't worry about it. Let me disable it for now to make you understand how Shuffle works. This is done. Now, EMP CSV file that I explained in the beginning is having around 10 million records. Now, before we read that, I'll use the schema for that file. So I'll paste the schema here. This is the schema that we have for that particular file. I'll read the file into a data frame EMP. So I'll write that. I'll write EMP is equals to spark dot read format. The format is CSV. Now we'll specify schema, which is underscore schema. And we have header in the file. So I'll specify option header, which is true. Slash input slash data sets and our employee records.csv. Now, if I run this, nothing should happen, right? Because we have already specified the schema. Let me go back and refresh the Spark UI. Nothing is there. Since we have already read the file, now we will find out the average salary per department and we will write the output in no of format in order to benchmark. Before that, let's write our data frame for average salary. So I'll name that as EMP average is equals to. Now we'll read the EMP data frame. We'll do a group by which would be on department ID. Now, 
since we are doing average, so we have to do aggregate. So I'll write AGG. Now we have to import the average function. So that I'll do. Now I'll write average and I'll do average of salary. So I'll write average of salary and I'll alias this column as average salary. So I'll write alias and the name of the column would be average sal. So we have written our data frame for average calculation. Now let's write this data. Now today we will use no op. So I'll show you how to use no op for performance benchmarking. So to write this data frame, I'll write EMP average. Before that, let me trigger this. Dot, I'll write and the format we will use as no op. No op are just used for benchmarking. Whenever you write using no op, it will not write the data anywhere. However, it will traverse through the whole data for performance benchmarking. So to do that, we'll write dot mode, which should be overwrite. And we'll just write save. So this will read the whole data for performance benchmarking, but it will not write the data anywhere. This is how we simulate Spark for benchmarking. Let me run this. Awesome. Now we have triggered our action, right? Let me go back and refresh the Spark UI. Great. We have our first action here. Let me expand this. Okay. Now, if you see, we have an exchange here. This is happening because of that group by. Now, if you see, Spark has divided it into two stages. The first stage is with 16 tasks and the another one with 200 tasks. Now, first stage, it is reading the data, whole 93 MB file, and it is writing the shuffle, which will be input for this 200 task. Now, why this is 200? Because Spark default partition is 200. Let's check the Spark partition setting. So to do that, I'll write spark.conf.get. And this is spark dot sequel dot shuffle dot partitions. If I run this, you see this is 200. By default, Spark has a shuffle setting of 200. So this is why 200 tasks are created. Now let's expand our first stage to understand more. If I scroll down, we can see all the four executors here, but we can see 40 records has been written by each. Why this is 40? Let me go back and show it to you. Now, we know we have a function called Spark Partition ID in order to show the partition number of the records. Now that we have imported the Spark Partition ID, let's view the partition formation. To do that, I'll write emp dot with column. I'll create a new column called Partition ID with Spark Partition ID. And I'll put a where condition on the first partition to show you what are the data in that partition. So I'll write partition ID equals zero. Now I'll just do a show here. Okay, you can see there are multiple departments in the same partition, right? So we know that each partition will contain more than one department. And that is why this there is 40 records each because each partition is being processed by each task which contain 10 departments. This is why we have four tasks each executor and 10 department per task. This is why 40 records are being written. Now, why only 40? Because each task is already doing the aggregation of average before writing it into the shuffle file. And we have this aggregation written in the shuffle files. And these shuffle files are sent over network. And in the next stage, these files are being read and the next narrow transformation happens. So let me go back to the stage two. This was the stage two. If I expand this, you see so many tasks are executed because we have around 200 tasks for this. But if you notice, the number of records read is very less in comparison to the number of tasks involved. And even multiple tasks have done nothing. Only few of them has read the records. And this is where it's overkill of the CPU usage. You have to decide the number of several tasks properly in order to optimize this. Now, if we go back to the data frame, we see it took 11 seconds in order to execute the first action that we did. Right. So let's do one thing. Let's properly decrease this shuffle partition into an appropriate number and again run this task. To do that, I'll write spark dot conf dot. Now we'll set this. So I'll write dot set. Again, I'll use the same configuration, which is spark SQL shuffle partitions. And I'll reduce this to a number called 100. Let's see what happened when we reduce this to 100. So I'll run this. Let's validate if it is set to 100. Yes, it is 100 now. Let me rerun the writing of the data. So I'll write again, run this. Let's wait. Okay. 
it's executed. Let's go back to the Spark UI, refresh this tab. You see, again, a job is created, and this time it has executed within three seconds. If I go into this particular job, again, the shuffle stage has happened, but if I scroll down, this time it has only used 100 tasks. Now, if I again open this, so many tasks executed, but again, this is an overkill because much of the tasks are doing nothing, only few of them are reading. Now, since we know that this is only few of them are going to read this data, which is very less, can we reduce the suffered partitions again? The answer is yes. Let's reduce to a number, say 16. Let me run this. If I again run this, let me go back. Before that, let me run this write operation again. Let me go back and refresh this. See, now it has reduced to one second. So, we have directly established a relation between that configuration, which is Spark SQL Shuffle Partitions, with the duration of the execution. Now, if I expand this job, 16 tasks are executed this time for the second stage. If I expand this, now we can see there is very less overkill and much of the Shuffle read are being processed by much of the task. Now, it brings to a question, what should be the appropriate Shuffle SQL Partition size? Now, we know that reducing the Shuffle Partitions can improve your tasks. But can we reduce it to a much lower number? The answer is no. You have to be very careful while configuring this property. Sometimes configuring this to very lower number can make your task run out of memory, which can lead in issues. Consider you have a lot of shuffle data which has to be read and you have reduced the number of tasks to such lower number that each task has to do that operation again and again. And this will again decrease your performance. So you have to be very careful and you have to identify a proper number before setting this up. But this has to be done very carefully. Now, that we have seen that shuffle partitions can improve your performance, but the data that we have read previously was not partitioned. What if we read a partition data? Will that improve the performance? Let's check it out. To do that, what I'll do is I'll read a partitioned CSV data, which is already present in EMP's partition based on the department IDs. So I'll read this data. So I'll write EMP partition, which is for partition. I'll write spark dot read dot format which is csv and again we will put the schema which is underscore schema and we will write the option which is headed true then i'll load the partition data for that i'll do slash data slash input emp partition dot csv so i'll run this if i go back and refresh the job you'll see nothing Let's do the aggregation again, but this time on the partition data. So I'll copy this query from the top. So I'll copy this aggregation query, but I'll change the data frame to EMP partition this time. Let me run this. Now again, for performance benchmarking, we'll write this data. So I'll copy this and we will run this. Awesome, the job completed. Let me go back to the Spark UI. If I refresh this UI now, you see, we have a job which completed within two seconds. Now, if I expand this, you can see first one has only used 15 tasks to read the data, but this time the shuffle write was very small. Why this is small? If I expand this and scroll down, you can see the write for each of the task was only one record because each of the task is reading a particular partition of data. There is no mix and match for that particular task. So it has to write only one record per task. That is why this is much easier this time. And each of the executor is writing five or six records. And that is where if we go back, now again, if we see the second stage, again, since our shuffle partition was set to 16, 16 tasks are reading the shuffle files and completing the aggregation. So we can see there's a performance benefit whenever we read a partition data. And that is what it is. Now, partition data provides you a benefit during shuffle. We will see more about it when we look for the optimization for joins. For now, you can just keep in mind, if the data is partitioned properly, it can give you a benefit on shuffles as well. Now that we have understood shuffle in great depth, before we can conclude, let's understand a few more important points. The first one being, always try to work with good shuffle. This implies avoid unnecessary shuffle wherever possible because shuffle is a costly operation. So always prefer wherever necessary. We do not go for shuffle operations without any need. The second one is repartition your data. This implies make sure your data is properly partitioned 
which can reduce in some. The third one is push the filter as early as possible. This implies filter your data before doing the aggregation or shuffle operation. This will reduce the data, hence reducing the shuffling amount. I hope you learned something new today. If you're liking my content, make sure to like and subscribe. Till then, keep learning, keep growing, keep sharing.